let's look at identity. Let's look at that thing that is right at the core of yourself, that most important thing that makes you you. That thing that says, I know who I've been, I know who I am now, and I know who I aspire to be. It's my identity, it's mine. Why do I share it with anybody else? But we do, just like the ripples that you have in a pool. You share your identity in widening circles. Those people who are closest to you, that you meet every day, are in the inner circle. And they're the ones who know what you look like, what you sound like, what you're going to think about. And as you go further out in those circles, you get further away from the individual, and your identity is easier to play with. People who think they may know you, but of course they don't. And it's much easier to cause identity fraud if you're in a wider circle than if you're in close-knit to the person. But there's a third part to identity, not just ours and that we share with those around us, but also those that we share with authority. So at po some point or another, authority is going to say, I need you to prove to me that you are who you say you are, and who you say you are is who you have always been. And where does your journey on that identity to authority start? Well, it starts on the day that you're born, because mum and dad rush down to the registry office and on a bit of paper, they sign your name and the date on which you were born and your mother's name is there and your mother's word for who your father might have been is also recorded on the document. <laughs> so what we fundamentally do is, in the start of your identity, you weren't involved. Somebody else was responsible for recording the information and recording it correctly. And there are millions of babies around the world that are not born with, that, that aren't issued with birth certificates. And it causes them no problems until they start to integrate with authority, because that's when the proof comes forward. And a, a birth certificate is an important document because it's a breeder document. It's the one that says, if I hold this powerful piece of paper, then I can introduce other papers. So that I might need it to get a marriage certificate. I might need it to get a driver's license. I might need it to get a passport. And what a passport says about your identity is that the sovereign of the country, if you're in the UK, says that I admit this is a citizen of my country, and I am happy because they hold a passport to pass into your country. And that's a terribly important part of identity because it's transferring the confidence of that identity to somebody else. And in the past, we've been very happy with that passport being a bit of paper and a photograph that's 20 years out of date. We know, and we were always surprised, that it ever, ever got through passport control. <laughs> but of course, our security conscious world now says that isn't good enough anymore. And our passports now have to carry more about our identity. And the chips that are embedded within our passports carry information about us biologically. It might be our fingerprints today, but then tomorrow it might be our entire genome, it might be some biometric that we've never yet quite thought of. So that our identity, as we portray it to the authorities, is changing, and the amount of, of influence that's been placed upon us to make our identities available is also increasing. But let's think about identity for a moment. It comes from a Latin word idem, which means the same, and I am not a mathematician, but even I can understand the mathematical equation here. A <laughs> equals A. It doesn't get much simpler. If you're going to be identical, then it must be identical. Aristotle gave us no wriggle room whatsoever. <laughs> a equals A. The subject of the proposition must equal the predicate. But that's a very tough rule to live by. And the philosopher Heraclitus understood, actually, that what you needed was a little bit of wriggle room. He said that the only thing we can guarantee is that things will change. And we have to understand how much change we're prepared to accept. So what Heraclitus said to us was that, you know, it's really unlikely that A is ever really going to equal A. A is going to look a bit like A. And how much of that looking like it are we prepared to tolerate? There are two quite distinct elements to the persistence of identity. And the first is the qualitative identity. And qualitative identity says each of the seats in this room look pretty much the same. They won't be identical because there'll be stains on some of them. There'll be scratches, <laughs> there'll be marks, there'll be tears. They won't be identical and they can't be identical because there's more than one. So when we're looking at qualitative identity, we're talking about things being separated by space and the differences between them being very difficult to tell apart. 
The classic thing within our field is identical twins. Oh, our scientists love to study identical twins. And of course, the biggest misnomer is that that's the one thing that they are not. <laughs> so identical twins are not identical. Quantitative identity is about saying, I have something at a point in time, and I have another thing at a point in time, and I want to know whether, in fact, these two things could be the same thing, but they've just been separated by a distance. An obvious example from that would be, you know, you leave school at 18, and 20 years later, you go back to school and you have your, your reunion. Nobody's going to identify you by the way you look. Those 20 years are rarely ever kind. <laughs> and so to get your classmates to accept that you are who you are, or who you're saying you are, you will share memories with them, you will share experiences with them, and their doubts about your identity will start to go away. So that if part of our identity is so made up within our memories and our psychological side, then why can we not use that when we're interacting with authorities? Well, the fact is we don't want to share our memories with authorities. So we have to find another way. And one of the most effective quantitative ways of identity is about looking at the body, the somatic form of our identity. What is it within our biological construct that we can and will share with our authorities? Now, there is a metaphysical uh, conundrum that is so incredibly well known in relation to identity, and it's the Theseus paradox. And the Theseus paradox said that when, when Theseus was coming back from Crete, having had a bit of a set to with the Minotaur, and the, the <laughs> ship is sailing into the harbour in Athens, he's a huge celebrity of the day. And the ship is an icon, a real emblematic icon. And as it's placed in the harbour, of course, Heraclitus told us it's biological, it's going to change. And of course it will, it's going to start to degrade. So the Theseus paradox says to us, how much change in identity will you accept before it's no longer the same thing? Is this the same ship when you change one plank of wood? Is it the same ship when you've changed half the planks of wood? Is it the same ship when you've changed all the planks of wood? How much change in identity are you prepared to tolerate before you can no longer match two sets of data? I'd quite like to go back to that Minotaur for a moment because he causes me a bit of problems. If anybody ever need a good slaying, it was the Minotaur. <laughs> he caused an enormous amount of toll on the people of Athens because what he said to the people of Athens was, the King Minos of Crete said, I want you to send me seven boys and seven girls every year, Scooby Snack, for the Minotaur just before lunch. <laughs> why did he choose seven girls and why did he choose seven boys? Because seven is the world's lucky number. If you were to take a huge poll and you were to look at what the top lucky number is, it's seven. And seven is so heavily embedded within our culture. We have seven deadly sins. We had seven brides for seven brothers. We had seven wonders of the world. We have seven colors in the rainbow. Marilyn had a seven-year itch. Seven is an incredibly important number in the world in which we operate. And of course, Fleming didn't give us 006, did he? <laughs> Even Snow White had seven dwarves, and what's really sad is you know that only one of them was ever happy. <laughs> and our lives are measured in instances of seven. Our weeks are in seven days. And here's our modern paradox for the modern world that says, okay, there is a myth there's a myth that says every seven years, every cell in your body replaces itself. So our paradox says, eight years ago, I murdered somebody. I didn't, but eight years ago, <laughs> I murdered somebody. And I've spent the last eight years in prison. Now there's not a single cell in my body present today that was there at that murder seven years ago. How can I be held guilty for it? I was actually never there. Anyone who's in cell biology knows that that's complete and utter bunkum because we don't have a seven-year cycle. If we look at sperm, for example, then they're going to replace themselves every three days. If we look at the epithelium that covers our colon, then that's replaced every four days. If we look at our skin, we shed it every three weeks. Our red blood cells are replaced and replenished every four months. If we look at our white cells, it's every year. 
If you look at our liver, thank heavens, it will regenerate <laughs> itself almost completely every two years. God bless it. <laughs> and if we think about the skeleton, the skeleton just takes up the end. It's a bit of a slow poke. Roughly between every 10 and 15 years, we'll have replaced and replenished every, every cell that's in our skeletal system. So even if we were to update our modern paradox that says, OK, I committed the murder 20 years ago. Now there can't possibly be a single cell in my body that holds the corporate memory for an action that I have committed. How can my identity match today and then? But of course, there are cells in the human body that are never replaced, that have a lifetime associated with your lifetime. And that includes the lens of your eye, the enamel within your teeth, and a little bit of doubt, but there's an area of bone called the petrous part of the temporal bone right deep inside your skull. Some people say that doesn't replace itself. I'm a bit dubious about it. <laughs> But if that's where our corporate, corporeal memory is sitting, well, we know that with age, the lens clouds over, we get cataracts, we can remove it. We know that we were designed to have three sets of teeth. We have baby teeth, we have grown-up teeth, and we have plastic teeth. <laughs> so that even the enamel <laughs> is not going to hold our corporate memory. And I don't believe, quite frankly, what's going on in the petrous part of the temporal bone. So is it true that we've not got a single cell in our body that will last beyond the 20 years of what we're responsible for in our society. Well, there are a group of cells. There are a group of cells that are not replaced, not replenished. You have as many of them on the day that you're born as you will have, maybe, on the day you die, but probably not, because a lot of them do die away with age, but they certainly won't be replaced. And these are the neurons that sit in your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. And these cells are the biggest international gossips on the planet. <laughs> there is nothing they like better than sitting on the garden fence talking to their neighbours. <laughs> and they will talk to everybody and anybody around them. And that space at which they're going to talk to each other is the synapse. And if you imagine that what you could do is step back from that scenario and listen and watch to what they're doing, do we have a pattern? Can we hear their chatter? Can we hear their conversation? Can we see the pattern of the talk that they're doing? If that's true, then do we have a neural identity? Do we have a mechanism within our central and our peripheral nervous system that is a marker of our identity, a truly unique biomarker? If you imagine what our passports might look like then by about the year hmm, 2030, perhaps, then what we'd have is we'd have our fingerprints, we'd have our entire genome on our passport, we'd have our vein patterns, we'd have our iris patterns, we'd have our retinal patterns, and maybe on there as well would be our neural map, our way of thinking, our self. We're told that memories are the architects of our identity. If they are the architects and the architecture, then surely we should be able to see them. And we think we can now. We think the research has been done that when you tag micromolecules with fluorescent dyes, they've been able, they think, to see in a mouse the point at which a memory is formed. And they think they've done that because they've installed false memories in the mouse. So they're sure that it's a memory. Imagine if we knew what the pattern of chatter looked like and sounded like when you lay down the memory. Imagine if we could then follow where we've laid that down memory and gone and find out where it's stored. And imagine the pattern of the chatter when we're trying to find it and recover it and bring it back. So do we have an ultimate biometric identifier out there in the ether somewhere that not only brings together our corporeal identity, but also brings together our psychological identity. Wouldn't it be the ultimate holistic biometric? Now, that's not really the challenge, though, because it isn't really a challenge to go and find a new biometric and then to test it out and to be able to look at what it's going to do. The real challenge, the real discovery, the real thing that is most important is how do you protect that identity? How do you design 
a bio firewall. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>